We will get to know Ronnie tonight um, through his poetry. As he said to me on the phone, uh, you can know me through my poems, and it's very true. Um, but we're also very blessed um, to have his very good friend, Rafi Weichart, um, professor of Hebrew literature at Haifa University. Um, he's also the editor of extremely prolific Keshe Publishing House which publishes books of world-famous poets in Hebrew translation. He's also in his own right an important poet, and it's no wonder that the city of Tel Aviv called him the most powerful voice in the Israeli poetry field. Um, Rafi has appeared on our Zooms recently with Erica Young as the co-translator of her recent volume. He's a very good friend of Rafi's, and he's also translated Rafi's poems as well. And I, before Rafi, begins his introduction. I also really want to um, introduce Karen Alkali Gut. Um, and I want to thank her for this evening as well because she helped put it together and in initiated it. And I appreciate the opportunity, Karen. Karen is a professor and poet and translator. She'll be reading the translations of Ronnie's poetry today, many of them which she has done herself. And she's got the most beautiful reading voice. So we're in for a treat. So I'm handing it over to you, Rafi. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening. I've taken a difficult, almost impossible task to present within minutes a poet who has been writing phenomenal Hebrew poetry for over 50 years, who has published 14 books, whose poetry was translated into more than 40 languages, whose poetry I've been reading for 40 years, which are nearly two thirds of my life. How can I make it brief? To live up to this distinguished task, I shall keep the biography to a minimum while stretching poetics to the maximum. It is known that Ronnie Somek was born in Baghdad in 1951 and made Aliyah in 1953 to an immigrant absorption camp. In the early 70s, Somek served in the army and had learned the horrors of war when he admitted the wounded soldiers of the Yom Kippur War to the hospital in Jerusalem. Later on, he studied Hebrew literature and Jewish philosophy at Tel Aviv University and was a high school teacher for nearly 40 years. For the past 37 years, he's happily married to Leora, and their daughter Shirley is currently working on her PhD in neuroscience. I thought we should recognize the numerous literary awards Somek received, but then we'd be here till midnight. His poetry is one of the best loved and read in Israel. His poetry had burst out and caught public attention within eight extremely creative years, 1976 till 1984, during which Somek published three books edited by the great poet Amir Gilboa, whose titles were composed of a single word, Exile in 1976, Solo in 1980, and Asphalt in 1984. 
In order to make this presentation clearer, I'd like to present four themes and few poems in which Somek taught us readers, including younger poets such as myself, to look back on our lives and our environment. First, the city. Having read the magical and decorated urban poetry of Nathan Alterman, the alienated urban space of David Avidan, and Mayor Wieseltier's violent city poems, we meet Ronnie Somek's new and fascinating combinations of all of the above, topped with a personal and humane gaze at streets that were never before mapped in Israeli poetry, and at some of its inhabitants no one had described before. One of many such characters is a wedding singer at a shabby wedding hall in the south side of the city, living on the margins of society. She sings to make others happy, yet her own life is bleak, and the poet identifies with her misery. In many of his poems, Somek sees the outlaws, the humiliated, the ones whose life did not set up to a happy chupa. Auto repair shop workers and supermarket cashiers, residents at cheap hotels and prisoners, people hospitalized at mental facilities, and children whose refrigerator at home is empty. All these and more receive poems dedicated to them while teaching the readers not to look away from human suffering. The flagship of Somek's early urban poetry is undoubtedly the love poem to the Yarkon River flowing at the heart of Tel Aviv. For my generation, it manifests the essence of our local patriotism, and Karen will read Seven Lies on the Miraculous Yarkon. Please, Karen. We don't hear you. Seven lines on the miraculous Yarkon. Soon the city of Tel Aviv will be drawn like a pistol. What will come from the sea starts with the hot wind, and on the street you can already hear the kind of quiet talk that follows a shooting. Too bad there's no circus in this town. Too bad there's no sword swallower, no magician. No elephants, no dragon. Too bad just one dinghy floats by. Right as I show someone, not from here, the miraculous Yokun. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. And now for the second theme, love. It seemed that at the turn of the millennium, one couldn't find anything new to add to this subject. Everything had already been written before. And then came Ronnie. Somek has written dozens of wonderful, original, imaginative, and inspired love poems. I'd like to divide them to two groups. The first consists of erotic poems centered around the urban bachelor who seeks moments of physical intimacy in the city streets and rented apartments. These poems are packed with an abundance of sexuality, transience, and loneliness but also with the beauty of very young people standing on the verge of their lives. The second kind are the marvelous love poems Somek has devoted to his wife, Leora. Love poems to a lifelong partner are rare in Hebrew and world poetry alike, but Ronnie Somek is once again a faithful student of his mentor Yehuda Michai in writing such poems with a mighty pen. The best known of these is probably his loving poem from the mid 90s, Wheat. Karen. Wheat to Leora and Shirley. A wheat field blows on my wife's head and on my daughter's head. How banal thus to, the, to describe blonde, but nevertheless, there grows the bread of my life. This beautiful piece was translated by the poet Vivian Eden from Jerusalem. And now, decades after this beautiful poem was written, Ronnie and Leora went to a hotel in Tiberias where he wrote this wonderful piece, the next one, to be read, translated by my wife, Daffy Kudish Weichert. Whenever I read it, whenever I read it, I find tears in my eyes. 
both for this great love and for this spectacular poetic outcome. Please, Karen. From the window at the Scots Hotel. I scratch out the word C from the name of the Kinneret, which remains indifferent to the winds of March. A true sea would have erected remnants of waves against them, shattering their faces on the jetty rocks. How fortunate it is that a storm requires only one look at the back of the head of the one who keeps on marrying me in the room. Thank you, Karen. The real life outcome of Ronnie and Leora's love is their daughter. Shirley, who was born when her father was 40 years old, is the only child in Hebrew poetry whose life and growth were described in poems for three decades. The first ones were written at the hospital when she was just born. One of the noted poems is in this group is the umbilical chord poem in which he describes his fascination and awe at the experience of birth. Later, he would write about her childhood, her ballet lessons, her first suitors, her military service and academic studies, all flowing with fatherly love and existential concern for her happiness. In time, Ronnie and Shirley would publish two children's books, The Laughter Bottom and Monkey Tough, Monkey Bluff, when Shirley was still a child herself. Now for family, so it's clear that family is one of the main themes of Ronnie Somek's poetry. He described his grandmother rising to a rice paradise, his beloved father and his paternal uncle who was lost in the war of independence. But I would like to focus on Daisy, Ronnie Somek's mother, who is the subject of some of his greatest poems. Daisy was a hardworking seamstress who was widowed in a new country. Somek always described her in majestic terms as Cleopatra, someone who cannot be praised enough. She had lived a long life, and as she neared her 19th birthday, she received some of the most touching senior poems I know in any language. When I read the line and I quote, my mother is queen of a single bench in Ramat Gan, I sob from the love that lies behind this seemingly simple metaphor. Let's read the whole poem named after the mother so you can see it too. Love wrapped in original and precise images with a compassionate gaze that gives no discounts to the troubles of old age. And this is a beautiful translation by Karen. Karen, Daisy, please. Daisy, the autumn of flesh is the hardest of falls. When the almost green eyes shed leaves, the arm is a bending branch, the leg a shaky truck, trunk, the leg a shaky trunk. In a season like this, words are disguised as beasts and roars hide themselves in the throat. The woman I'm writing about is my mother, if I had Arabic ink in my pen, I would call her Shahrazad. If I knew how to draw crowns, she'd be a queen. And in the courtyard of her palace, you could hear the rustle of sands she sweeps from the piles of strife. But even now, when her gait is rough and the teeth of winter bite at her feet, you can feel how much hunger there had been in the fingers that wove the reddest of carpets on which now she treads slowly the remains of her days. What a great love poem, great love poem. The last light I'd like to shine is on the Holocaust poems. A poet born in Baghdad just a decade after the Farhud pogroms takes on this territory of anguish of European Jews and writes about and for its victims, some of whom he had met growing up in Israel. He writes from an overall historical perspective about the dilemma of the new Germany after the war in his poem, Tractors. 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 
The sons of Men Dr. Mengele sell tractors on the road between Munich and Stuttgart. Whoever buys them will plow the land, water a tree, paint the shingles of a house red, and later at the beer festival, watch the local band collect in the open square like tin soldiers in a shop window. At the beauty salon of history, the skilled ones comb each lock of hair, even on the head of a beast. Thank you, Karen. Years later, he will write from a closer perspective about his first encounter as a child with a Holocaust survivor whom the children named Mr. Auschwitz and other people he'd met as a boy and embodied the Holocaust in his young eyes. I'm happy you are here to listen to Ronnie's wonderful poems in his voice. One of the miracles in my life is that the poet I admired as a young soldier turned into a family member and a companion on the road of creation. We attended many weddings together and sadly many funerals. Our wives are close friends and our daughters, we each have one, love each other. I wish Ronnie many more years of creation and for myself, I wish the closeness and his loving and inspiring presence. Thank you all. Thank you, Rafi. That was really wonderful. Um, and you capture the, the spectrum of Ronnie's poetry and his history so beautifully, um, which is wonderful because tonight's poems that I've chosen are more Iraqi focused. I've also divided them into groups. And the first group we're going to read is actually about memory. Um, as Rafi said, Ronnie is from Baghdad. And that's. Oh, well only one sentence. I like to say thank you very much to Rafi. It was it was amazing. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Daffy. And Ronnie, I have to tell you, anytime you want to interrupt, please do, because everyone wants to actually hear you tonight, not me. Um, so I'm just going to let's go on to the first group. Um, it's about memory, and just to maybe say that um, that. To note that the Salima Murad was a famous Jewish Iraqi singer who was also no, known as Salima Pasha. She's um, and also Um Kultum was a famous Egyptian diver who was also known as the Egyptian songbird and also very famous to all Iraqis. Um, so let's go straight into these four these poems of memory that Ronnie will read now. We'll start with Baghdad. Yeah, no. Uh, first of all, I like to tell a story. Now, first of all, I like to tell a story about uh, a cat that ran after a mouse. The mouse found the hole and entered it. After a while, the mouse heard the bark of a dog, and they thought, if I hear the bark of a dog, probably the cat ran away. Then he left his hole, opened his eyes, and saw the cat. I, I know he said to the cat, but now you tell me to your dinner, but tell me how I hear the bark of a dog. And the cat smiled and answered, today you cannot manage without two languages. Uh, um, I will take the Hebrew and uh, Sarah and Karen will take the English and the first poem is Baghdad. Beoto gil, bo mesamen shotel gufa, bezirat haretzach, אני מסמן את גבולות העיר בה נורו חיי, אני חוקר עדים, סוחט להם מהשפתיים טיפות ערק ומחכה בהיסוס צעדי ריקוד של פיתה על קערת חומוס. שיתפסו אותי, ינקו לי שליש על התנהגות טובה ויכלאו אותי בפרוזדור גרונה של סלים המורד. במטבח הקלט אתגן עמי את הדג שאימה שלטה מימי הנהר ותספר על המילה דגים, שהתנוססה על שלט ענקי בפתח מסעדה חדשה. מי שאכל שם קיבל דג בגודל של סיכה, עד שאחד הלקוחות ביקש מבעל המקום להקטין את השלט או להגדיל את הדג. הדג יתקור בעצמותיו, ידביע את היד שמרתה את קשקשיו 
ואפילו שמן רותח על מחבת החקירה לא יוצאים מפיו מילה מפלילה. הזיכרון הוא צלחת ריקה מצולקת משריטות סכין על עורה. This translation is by Edran Levy, uh, Baghdad. With the same chalk, policeman marks a crime scene corpse. I mark the boundaries of the city where my life was shot. I interrogate witnesses, squeezing drops of arak from their lips and mimicking the dance moves of pita bread over a hummus bowl with some hesitation. When I'm caught, they will take off one third my sentence for good behavior and incarcerate me in the hallway of Salima Morad's throat. In the prison kitchen, my mother would be frying the fish that her mother had pulled out of the river waters whilst recalling the word fish emboldened on a massive sign in front of this brand new restaurant. Whoever ate there would be served fish no bigger than a pin. That is until one of the customers asked the owner either to make the sign smaller or the fish bigger. The fish would prick with its bones, drowning the hand that had descaled it, and not even hot oil in the interrogation pan could get so much as an incriminating word out of its mouth. Memory is but an empty plate, scarred with a knife scratch marks on its skin. עזה, חורף 1968, לזכר הימים שבילינו במסעדות בעזה. במסעדה ליד הים אמי ואבי אכלו דג. ככה הם אמרו היו המסעדות על שפת החידקל בעיר בה נולדת, ובשיר של עבדול ווהאב שאתה שומע עכשיו לא השתנתה אפילו מילה. ריח הקפה התנגב כעשן להבה שפעם הסתלסלה על תיבות זהב של פילגשי מלכים ששלטו שם, ואני שהרגשתי את קירת העצם ששרדה מליבו של אותו דג ידעתי כבר אז שרגלי העץ של השולחן עליה נפרסה מפה לבנה לא יחלימו לעולם משני המסור שנגס אותן. This is uh, my poem about Aza and uh, I like uh, to say that the poet who lives in uh, Israel uh, he from time to time is like the pianist that we see in the Western uh, movie. He put his piano uh, in the corner of the saloon, in the place that always smell with uh, gem, uh, powder. He know that this saloon is not a concert hall, and from time to time he said, for his safety, don't shoot me, I am only the pianist. And uh, I feel in uh, that situation that uh, the poem about Aza It's like uh, some, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a part from, from the uh, repertoire of uh, this pianist. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to read that? Do you want me to read the poem? It's your, uh, we both have the, the, uh, the great voice for it. Go for you. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Gaza. One winter. Just pull it down a bit, Michael. I can't. Uh, I'll. Winter. Gaza, winter 1968. In a rest to Ayman Hassan. In a restaurant by the sea, my mother and father were having fish. That's what they were saying. The restaurants were like on the banks of the Tigris in the city where you were born. And in the Abdel Wahab song you're hearing right now, not one lyric has changed. 
The smell of coffee crept in like smoke from a flame that once swirled on the gold chests of king's concubines, the monarchs of this place. And I, who felt the prick of the surviving bone from the fish's heart, already knew that the wooden legs of the table on which a white tablecloth had been laid shall never recover from the saw's teeth that bit into it. חול, מוקדש לשקית החול שעלי פראג' הביא לי משפת החידקל. אם לחול הזה היו ידיים, הן היו מציירות על שפתיי ארבסקות של המילים הראשונות שיצאו מפי. אם היה לו מוח, הוא היה זוכר רגלי תינוק שהתרוצצו על פניו. אם היה לו עיניים, הן היו רואות שלמי החידקל יש לפתע שגרירי דמעה במדינת עיניי. האמת, אלי פראג' on May before three years in the University of Milano, and he came to me and he told me, I have a gift for you, and he gave me Um, a little sakit, um, um, a bag, with uh, sa- uh, sand from the Tigris. And for me, it's very, a bit of sakit, um, and for me, it's very important. Oh. Hope all the others for him. Come, come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the bag. This is the bag. And here, sand from the... from the Tigris. Wow. It's, I understand that. I understand how special that is. It's, yeah. yeah. Nice. Sand. To the sandbag Gavi Faraj brought me from the banks of the Tigris. If this sand had hands, They would paint arabesques of the first words to leave my mouth across my lips. If it had a brain, it would recall a baby's feet running around its face. If it had eyes, they would notice that the tigress waters suddenly stationed ambassador tears in the state of my eyes. סוד. אולי לא צריך לספר את זה, אבל אמא שלי בכתה שלפתע שמעה את קליאופטרה. אז מי אתה, אדון עבדלוהאב, שתיקח מלכה מצרית מספר ההיסטוריה ותתרגם אותה לדמעות בספר הזיכרונות של אמי? ואת, קליאופטרה, שוברת לבבות בפוקר הנוסטלגיה ברחוב קטן ברמת גן. האם את זוכרת את שרירי העבדים ששלו פנינים כדי לפאר את כתרך, את הגרונות שחנקת בבתי הקפה של בגדד, ואת הרוח שהיכתה בדלתות שחלקו צירים על מפתן בטן שהסתירה סוד? מזמן לא כתבתי בצפיפות כזאת את המילים נוסטלגיה, דמעות או זיכרונות, אבל המילים האלה הם שיני מסרק שבו אני במקום שפחה מצרית מלטף את שערך, שתהיי יפה קליאופטרה, שתהיי ראויה להמס עוד פעם את קצה הקרחון שמתחתיו מאייתים דגי זהב את המילה שמש מתוך הזיכרון. Secret. It might not bear repeating, but my mother wept when she suddenly heard Cleopatra. So who are you, Mr. Abdul Wahab, to lift an Egyptian queen off the history books and translate her into tears in my mother's diarized memories? And you, Cleopatra, breaking hearts in nostalgia's game of poker, 
on a small Ramadgan side street. Do you recall the muscle-bound slaves who had died for pearls with which to glorify your throne? The throats you had choked up in Baghdad cafes and the wind that lashed at the doors whose hinges creaked against a belly harboring a secret. It's been a while since I last wrote the words nostalgia, tears, or memories in such close proximity. But these words are the teeth of a comb with which I, in lieu of an Egyptian mistress, stroke your hair. May you be beautiful, Cleopatra. May you be worthy of melting once more the tip of the iceberg below which goldfish spell out the word Son, from memory. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so this you could have said that Cleopatra is a song that Abdul Wahab sings. Yeah, so Abdul Wahab, um, I forgot to mention, was a prominent 20th century Egyptian singer, actor, and composer. So Cleopatra was a song he sang, and that was a beautiful tribute to Ronnie's mother. Um, and this brings us to our second group, which is about family. Um, in Iraq, you do know that everything is very centered around family, especially the grandmother. And this was a very special poem, Rice Paradise. Um, and when I read it, it just reminded me of my grandmother. And my aunt actually tells a story of her grandmother say, saying, you must eat the rice because the rice will be sad if it's left behind. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for this next set of poems. All the color of the rice. <laughs> yeah. All the colors. Gan Eden Leores. Safta Shili. Asrala Shir Ores Batsalachat. Bimkom le sapera la raav behodu. Balaela dim ne fucheha beten shayu poarim pe al kol gargir. Igarara beharikot masleg. את כל השאריות למרכז הצלחת, ובעיניים כמעט דומעות, סיפרה איך יעלה האורז, הלא החול, להתלונן אצל האלוהים. עכשיו היא מתה, ואני מדמיין את שמחת המפגש בין שיניה התותבות לשומרי החרב המתהפכת בשער גן העדן של האורז. הם יפרסו מתחת לרגליה שטיח אורז אדום, ושמש אורז צהוב תקע לובן גופן של יפיפיות הגן. סבתא שלי, תמרח שמן זית על עורן ותחליק אחת אחת לסירים הקוסמים במטבחו של אלוהים. סבתא, מתחשק לי לומר לה, אורז הוא צדף שהתכווץ ואת נפלט כמוהו מים חיי. Rice Paradise. My grandmother never let us leave rice on the plate. Instead of telling us of hunger in India and the children with swollen bellies who would have opened their mouths wide for each grain, she would push all the leftovers with a shrieking fork to the center of the plate and almost in tears Tell us how the uneaten rice would rise to the heavens to moan to God. Now she is dead. And I imagine the joy of the encounter between her false teeth and the angels with flaming sword at the gates of rice paradise. They will spread a carpet of red rice under her feet and the yellow rice sun will beat down on the white bodies of the garden's beauties. My grandmother will spread olive oil on their skin and slip them one by one into the cosmic vessels of God's kitchen. Grandma, I want to tell her, rice is a seashell that shrunk, and like it, you rose from the sea, the water, the water of my life. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and now I like uh, 
uh, to make a good relationship in my family. And after a poem about uh, my grandmother, this is a poem about my grandfather. Uh, the title is Chala uh, Varayot, Line Mill. סבי נולד בארצות הערק, ועל תוויות הבקבוקים צוירו אריות מסורקי רעמה בפוזה של כבשה. זה מלך החיות הייתה אצבעו רועדת, ובשפמו הדק שרטטה הרוח את קווי האורך וקווי הרוחב של הג'ונגל שחלמתי עליו. מזל שטעיתי בדרך. אחרת ג'ק דניאלס יכול היה להיות אבי, וג'ין הייתה מנענעת את הריסת הטוניק בגרוני, ורק בבקבוקים הריקים שרציתי לזרוק לים, טמנתי לזכרו פתק, שיכור מאהבה. And now, this is a bottle of arak from a Sarig uh, 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 winery, and they make a arak, and uh, And, and, and the title of the Arak is my poem. Ah, yeah. wonderful. The, eti- the, the, the etiquette. Mm-hmm. Yes, same. Yes. And this Arak got a prize all over the world. Every time they give me the Arak with another uh, stamp <laughs> of prize. And uh, this is my revenge to see how the Arak of my, my grandfather from Baghdad now all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty wonderful. Thank you. Chaim. Chaim. <laughs> Lion milk. My grandfather was born in the land of Arak. The bottle labels showed lions with comb of manes posing, posing as sheep. This is the king of beasts, his trembling finger pointing to the jungle I was dreaming of. The wind... raking lines of longitude and latitude through the sparse hairs of his mustache. Luckily, I went astray. Otherwise, Jack Daniels could have been my father, and Jane would have rocked the tonic cradle in my throat. And only in empty bottles I want to cast into the sea, I stashed in his memory. Notes. Drunk with love. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Karen. It's the Arak. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Arak. it does it. Okay. After mother, grandfather, and grandmother, now the uncle. Uncle Salim. Bayamim shaya kavod le kartisei arakevet, vid pisu tam al lo pachot mi karton yarok, היה דוד סלים שולף מכיס הז'קט ערימה קטנה שאסף בתחנת חיפה ועזרנו לדמיין הגה ברווח העגול שבין יד ליד. עצמנו עין אחד, קירבנו את הנקף שבכרטיס לשנייה ודרכו ראינו עניבה חדה כחרב שהוא ענב בשביל לטשטש את עליבות חולצת החקי של עבדי המסילה. אז היה ננשף מפיו זיכרון הקטרים שהריץ על פסי ברזל של ארץ אחרת, והקרונות המלאים סיפורים מהפרת והחידקל היו נושמים אוויר נקי יותר מאוויר הנפתלים שדפק ב- 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 במזוודות הזיכרון של העולים החדשים. הרכבת לגן עדן שמע לפני מותו, יוצאת בעוד שלוש דקות. וזה בדיוק הזמן להעמיס על הקרונות את תשעים ותשע שנותיו, את המגבעת שאהב להזיז מצד לצד, ואת שאריות התרועות שתמיד שמר לקולו של עבד אל ווהאב. Uncle Salim. In the days when train tickets still commanded some respect and were printed on green cardboard paper and nothing less, Uncle Salim would pull out of his jacket pocket a small pile he'd collected at the Haifa railway station and help us 
Imagine a steering wheel in the round space between one hand and the other. We would close one eye, hold the punch ticket hole up to the other, and through it we saw the razor-sharp red tie he wore to hide the sad state of the rail workers' khaki shirts. He would then exhale the memory of locomotives that he once ran along the rail tracks of another land and the carriages heaving with tails from the Tigris to the Euphrates would breathe air that much cleaner than the mothballed scent that clung to the new immigrants' memory baggage. The train service to heaven, he heard just before he died, will be departing in three minutes. And that was exactly the right time for him to load up his 99 years onto the carriages, the top hat he loved pushing to and fro, and also traces of the cheers he always he had always saved for the sound of Abdul Wahab's voice. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So the next section we're going to be, this was the section I chose about the Mabara, which is the reality of the immigrants to Israel. And I chose this especially because Ronnie gives voice to an experience that I guess people like my father, who was also in a Mabara, he arrived at the age of five in 1951 from Baghdad and he never speaks about it. So this is a special thank you to Ronnie for expressing what the stories from there and, and the feelings of what it was like. And just to um, explain Arab labor, that the, the poem Arab labor, it's Hebrew slang for poor labor. And when Ronnie talks about the Deir Hana is an Arab village in the Galilee in northern Israel, where a major strike in the 1980s of Arab women textile workers, just to say that before we begin the next section. So thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. Kava Oni. Kilu efshar limtoach kav velomar mitachtav Oni. Ina alechem shebetzivei pur zolim niya shachor. והזיתים בצלחת קטנה על מפת השולחן. באוויר, אף ריונים במטס הצדעה לצלילי הפעמון שביד מוכר הנפט בעגלה האדומה, והיה גם כל הנחיתה של מגפי הגומי באדמה הבוצית. הייתי ילד בבית שקראו לו צריף, בשכונה שאמרו עליה מעברה, הקו היחיד שראיתי היה קו האופק, ומתחתיו הכל נראה עוני. Here's the bread wearing cheap makeup, turning black, and here are the olives on a small plate on the tablecloth. In the air, pigeons fly and salute to the clanging bell from the kerosene's vendor's red cart, and there is the squishing sound of rubber boots landing in mud. I was a child in a house called a shack in a neighborhood called transit camp for immigrants. The only line I saw was the horizon and under it, everything seemed poverty. Oh. And now this is a poem about uh, my uncle. יוסף סומך. החוק הראשון של הג'ונגל, שיר נעדר. החוק הראשון של הג'ונגל הוא שאין חוקים. לא הכרנו, אבל המילים הראשונות שאבא הביא מן האולפן היו מקום קבורתו לא נודע, והוא פיזר אותם כקווי אש לאורך חייך 
בחייו. מישהו סיפר שראו אותו, שראו אותך במטושטש במכון המטאורולוגי שבבית דגן, ובלילה חזר נושא את שמך כשק תפוחי אדמה. הסכין שצריכה הייתה לחתוך בקליפת הגעגועים נחה במגירה, משחזרת בפנטזיות בהם שלפתי אותך משיני האריות. הייתי בן ארבע, וגם ללשונות האש מן הפתילייה היה לוע של דרקון. First Law of the Jungle, Poem for a Soldier Missing in Action. First Law of the Jungle, there are no laws. And in the elephant's valley of death, the wind's can opener scratches your body squeezed into a can of preserves. We didn't know each other yet, but the first Hebrew words father brought home from the Ulpan were, the place of his burial is unknown, scattering them like fire lines along your life and his. Somebody said maybe it was you at Bet Dagan's Meteor Meteorological Institute and him returning at night, carrying your name like a, stack of, like a sack of potatoes. The knife that should have sliced the crust of longing lies in the drawer, honed by fantasies of rescuing you from lion fangs. I was four years old, and the tongues of flame from the kerosene stove leapt from the dragon's gullet. איזה שירים, רוני. איזה קריאה. וואו. כן. עבודה ערבית. מאיזה חוט ייהרג דגל ההפגנה של פועלות הטקסטיל מדיר חנה, בתעלות השריטה לאורך כפות הידיים, חותרת טיפת זיעה כספינת עבדים למפרץ הצלקות בציפורניים. אני נזכר בשנים הראשונות של אימא שלי בארץ, עולה חדשה, יושבת בחדר מכונות התפירה של בית החרושת רקם, מצחה חרוש פקעת חוטים, האצבעון הוא קסדת המלחמה, וחרב המחט נדקרת בבטן הבד, ממנו נתפרו בגדי החג, סרבלי העבודה ומטפחת הדמעה. Arab label. What thread will the seamstresses from Dir Khana use to weave their protest? Drops of sweat in a row like a galley of slaves along the canal of the palm's lifeline towards the fingernails bay of scars. I remember my mother's early years in this country, a new immigrant. peddling sewing machines and a wing in the Reckham factory. Her brow wrinkled like a spool, the thimble like a helmet, and the needle a sword stabbing in the belly of the cloth out of which holiday garments were sewn and workers' overalls and the handkerchief of tears. Wow. And uh, after uh, Fairuz, Salim Amurad, Abdul Wahab, and now the Queen, Um Kultum. Yeah. Lili Olayla. Ata yodea, amra shkena Rusiya lavi, Um Kultum azot shata shomea bekole kolot, amra shetavo lashir betel aviv akhare shabdol natser ikhbosh ota. Amati liado, ובמוחי בן השבע התרוצצה דילמה, האם אני בעד הבלונד ועיני הטורקיסט של האישה 
שהייתה גם אימא של לילי, שאותה הכתרתי בליבי למלכת היופי של שכונת מפוני המעברות, או בעד הזמרת שרצתה לחיות בעיני הלילה ולקרוא לשמש, בואי, בואי. אנחנו, יצאו המילים משפתיו של אבי, אוהבים אותה, ובעיניו ראיתי שחלם לומר, אם זה נכון, אז יאללה נעצר, בוא, אפילו לדקה, שמור לי מקום בשורה האחרונה, ואל תיתן לי להפסיד את השנייה, ויעיף קולה אפילו את עניבות הפרפר מצוואר הכנרים. Eve or evening, you do know, our, neighbor, our Russian neighbor said to my dad, that Um Kultum, you're always playing it full blast, said she would come and sing in Tel Aviv when Abdel Nasser had captured it. I stood next to him, and in my seven-year-old mind, a dilemma ran rampant. Was I in favor of the woman's blood, blonde coif and turquoise eyes, who was also Eve's mom, and who, in my heart, I had crowned migrant, migrant camp neighborhood beauty queen? Or the Chanteuse who longed to live in the evening's eyes and beckoned the sun, come hither, come hither. We, the words of the left my father's lips, love her. And in my eyes, I saw him wishing he could only say that, if that is the case, then have at it, Nasser. Do your worst, and if only for a moment, save me a front row seat. And don't let me miss the second her voice blows even the bow ties right off the violinist's necks. Thank you. That's beautifully read. Thank you. And so now we're just going to move on to um, more poems that, may, that, that describe Ronnie becoming a poet and being a poet. Ronnie studied under Yehuda Amichai and Amir Gil Gilboa and had actually, he, he stands within the canon of Israeli poets and helped form what is Israeli poetry today. So I, I really felt these poems describe, help bring that to the fore. And um, yeah, the last poem is, is my question of, of what is tomorrow? How does Roni see our tomorrow? Um, so thanks, Roni. And the, this is a poem about the first of the first. I don't know how to say that. ארס פואטיקה או ההבדל בין כדורסל לטניס שולחן. כשהדפיסו את השיר הראשון שלי, הייתי בן 16 וחצי, שחקן כדורסל. גבי המאמן הצמיד את כתף הטרנינג שלו בשלי ואמר, יש מישהו עם שם דומה לשלך שכותב שירים. היד שהמשיכה להקפיץ את הכדור למדה אז להאט את המילה זהה, הפה הכחיש, אפילו קילל, מוחק את האפשרות שהוא פה פואטי. אחר כך ידעו ואמרו, תמסור כבר את הכדור, מה, אתה חושב עכשיו על שורה? לא חשבתי. ואת נעלי הכדורסל תליתי מזמן. והיו לי זריקות עונשין, והתפרצויות יחיד, וכדורים מחצי פינה. והדף היה מטאפורה לאותו מגרש ברחוב מכבי ליד קולנוע אוריון, אבל לא. לפעמים השיר הוא גם כדור פינג פונג, קטן, לבן, שקוף משהו, נהדף במחבת עץ המצופה בפלסטיק דוקרני, עובר מעל הרשת המסמנת בדייקנות יפנית את אמצע השולחן. Ars poetica, or the difference between 
basketball and table tennis. I was 16 and a half, a baseball player, when my first poem appeared. Gabby, the coach, jostled his sweatshirted shoulder against mine and said, there's somebody with a name similar to yours who writes poetry. My hand continued dribbling, then learned to spell the word sweat. My mouth denied, even cursed the fact that it might be a poetic mouth. Later, they knew and teased. Pass the ball, will you? Dreaming up a line, are you? I wasn't and hung up my basketball sneakers long ago and did free throws and drives and half-court shots on the page that stood for the court on Maccabi Street near Orly Cinema. But no, at times the poem is a ping pong ball, small, white, almost translucent, hit by a wooden racket encased in prickly plastic over the net marking with Japanese precision the exact middle of the table. לא אני. לא ראיתי צלקות על ירחי הנשים שנאנסו בקישנור. לא תקעתי ירח על כידון הברוש. לא החלפתי גלגל לג'יפים שנתקעו בבאבל וואד. לא ריחמתי על ילדי הגן ולא רצתי על גשר. שבגד ביונתן. במקום זה כתבתי עם יונה וולח המנון לבית הזונות של פאני היל וסחפתי עם עמיחי סלי תפוחים שקנינו בירושלים העתיקה מהבסטה של אבו חליל. בבית, בבית יין בדרום תל אביב סובבתי עם גורי פקק על ראשו של יוחנן המהלך מתחת לכוכבים שבלי שום תירוץ השתכרו בחוץ עם שורות של ביאליק, הראתי לכמה נשים עיניים רעבות פרוצה שישבה בחלון ואת פטיש צרותיי הגדולות. משורר לאומי צריך פטיש אחר שימסמר את רגליו לקרקע שוב ושוב. אני שומר על זכות הריחוף. I have to say something. Yeah. That there, there are lines here that come from other classic poets like Chaim Guri, uh, like... Uh, uh, Bialik. Uh, Bialik. Alterman. 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 <laughs> right. Yes. And Amichai. Amichai. And yeah. So this is not me. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I was very pleased to find this in, translated in Polish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not me. I did not see the scars on the thighs of the women who were raped in Kishinev. I didn't pierce the moon on a spear of Cyprus. I didn't change the tire of the jeeps that were trapped in Babel Wad. I didn't pity the children in the kindergarten. And I didn't run on the bridge that betrayed Jonathan in this place. With Yona Wallach, I wrote a hymn to the whorehouse of Fanny Hill. And with Amichai, I carried baskets of apples that we bought in old Jerusalem from the stall of Abu Khalil. In the wine shop in South Tel Aviv, I twisted the cap on a Jonathan Walker with Guri under the stars. With no excuse, we got drunk outside. With lines of Bialik, I showed a few hungry women, a prostitute sitting in the window, and a, the hammer of my great sorrows. A national poet needs a different hammer that will nail his feet to the ground again and again. I maintain the right to hover. טומור, 
Uh, I wrote uh, this poem in March 2020, uh, maybe in the first week of the COVID-19. מחר. ברגע זה, כל מילה היא רעף בגג הבית שאבנה מחר. בחוץ קר. זו לא סטירת הרוח של מרץ או אגרוף הברד מהחודש שעבר. זוהי המכה מתחת לאין חגורה, הטבע, הוא אגרופן המכיר רק מילה אחת, נוקאוט. פיליפ שולח ממילאנו תצלומים של ארונות קבורה, איזה בזבוז להפקיר את החום הדמדם של המארגוני ולטמון אותו באדמה, אני שולח מבט לטיפות האחרונות שנשארו בבקבוק המרטיני ונזכר בדוכן המכירות הראשון של המשקה שם באותה מילאנו. למי ששכח, הכל מתחיל בוורמוט ו-18% של אלכוהול נקי מושרה בעשבי טיבול. אז בואו נשתה לזכרם רוסו, ביאנקי או אקסטר דריי. סלאח מתקשר מפריז ומזכיר לי שהרוח הרעה נושבת גם בעיר בה נולדנו. קורונה בגדדית עם ערבסקות, הוא מחבר לקללה שהיא הגרוש שהיה חסר לדינר בבורסה של עיראק. וברמת גן, אני רוצה להדהיר את המכחול כמו שבשיר אבו רביע ממלא את סוסיו בצבעי האינסוף. אני רוצה שקיוזו משבעת הסמוראים יציל אותנו, שיבוא וילפוט שוב את חרבו כילד המאגרף את הסוכריה האחרונה בכיסו, שיזכיר לצלופן שעליו להסתיר את אותה סוכריה משיני העולם. מחר יהיו הרעפים מהשורה הראשונה גג מטאפורי של בית קפה למשל. שם נבין סוף סוף שגם ערבוב חלב בתחתית הספל יכול לברוא עולם חדש. Tomorrow. Right now, every word is a tile on the roof of the house I'll build tomorrow. It's cold outside. It's, it's not the slap of the March wind or a punch of hail from last month. This is a blow beneath the beltless. Nature is a boxer who knows only the word knockout. Philip sends photographs of coffins from Milan. What a waste to sacrifice the red-brown of mahogany and bury it in the ground. I glance at the last drops left in the martini bottle and remember the first kiosk of that drink in that very Milan. In case someone has forgotten, it all begins with vermouth, and 18% of pure alcohol soaked with herbs. So let's drink to their memory. Rosso, Bianco, or extra dry. Sala calls from Paris and reminds me that the evil wind is blowing as well in the city we were born. Baghdadi Corona with arabesques. He composes a curse that That was the last piaster missing from the dinar in the stock exchange of Iraq. And in Ramad Gan, I would like to make the brush gallop the way Bashir Abu Rabia fills his horses with paint of eternal colors. I want Kyuzo from the Seven Samurai to save us. To come and grasp his sword once more like a child who clenches his last candy in his pocket to remind the cellophane that it must hide that sweet from the teeth of the world. Tomorrow, the tiles from the first line will be a metaphoric roof of a coffee house, for instance. There we will understand at last that stirring milk in the bottom of the cup can create a new world. 
Thank you, Karen. Thank you for your beautiful reading and for your beautiful translations. That was the last poem. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafi, Duffy, Sarah, Karen, Michael. It was amazing Zoom, believe me. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And Michael Kagan, also behind Zoom, just in case I forget you at the end. Thank you for just like being the techie guy and making the readings go so smoothly. Um, just thank you to the whole IAWE team as well. A, a lot goes, a lot of effort goes into these events and just a, a, a real thank you and appreciation because we don't want to forget that. And thank you, Ronnie, very much for your poetry and for your beautiful reading as well. Um, do we have time for questions? I know we've gone a bit over. Sure. Because um, Stephen has a question. I've got a hundred questions, but I'll ask my questions another time. Um, Stephen actually asked one about um, poetry. He asked, what is generally your process in writing poetry, Ronnie? Um, do you just, are they born sp spontaneously in one swoop or do you write many versions of each poem um, until it's complete? It's, it's, it's changed from uh, uh, poem to poem. Uh, oh. Yes, uh, I have uh, some uh, uh, poems that I read in one, uh, in, in two minutes. And for example, for one of my points, I wait uh, 30 years. Wow. Uh, yes, this is, uh, um, if I know the, 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 the secret, I, uh, go, I, I, I go tomorrow to the patent house and uh, <laughs> written a patent about, uh, about my name. One of the things I loved is in one of your interviews, they asked you about studying under Yehuda Amichai, and you say in the interview that Amichai said he can't teach you to write poetry, but he can teach you how to erase. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, for example, this is a, I, I, I like to read a poem that I uh, wrote in one minute. Uh, in Hebrew, it's, uh, it's called Shir Oshel. אנחנו מונחים על העוגה כמו בובות חתן קלה. גם אם תבוא הסכין, ננסה להישאר באותה הפרוסה. In English it's like uh, a poem of bliss where standing on a wedding cake like two dolls, bride and groom, uh, if the knife will strike, we try to stay on the same slides. Um, I wrote this poem in one minute. Uh, it's really wonderful. It's probably a balance of both. Um, so, yes, yes. So, so I have a question. Um, Amal Baha just last week came out with this um, interesting article. And one of the things he writes is, if you put a Mizrahi writer in a room of Ashkenazim, um, how, how does it, what what is it to you to be a Mizrahi writer in Israel? You're very, you've created Israeli poetry in terms of you've created the face and you've studied under the masters of Israeli poets who are all Ashkenazim. So as an Iraqi Jewish poet, as a poet who also can be considered an Arabic poet, how, how would you respond to that? I am not לא מחפש שורשים בגלל שאף פעם לא איבדתי אותם. ומה שאני מנסה לעשות זה לבנות גשר בין מזרח לבין מערב. So עכשיו אני just, רוצה... Wait, let me just translate that. Okay. So Roddy said something really beautiful and I really relate to it. He said he's not trying to find his roots because he never lost them. What he's trying to do is build a bridge between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim. I am very proud that I was one of the 15 Iraqi poets. So they chose him to be part of um, 15 Iraqi poets in the world. He's very proud of this. ושירים שלי מופיעים באנתולוגיות של 
משוררים עיראקים, הם טוענים שאני משורר עיראקי גולה שחי בישראל. So he's been, his poems are in anthologies of Iraq, for Iraqi poets, and he's considered an Iraqi poet in exile, which is fascinating. Living in Israel. Living in Israel. Thank you. Yeah. Just watch me on the translation. Thank See? you. Yeah, no. This is, for example, uh, modern poetry in translation. Uh, and and uh, here in modern poetry in translation, uh, that uh, Sadi, uh, 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 Daniel Weisberg and Sadi Reslot did Shem Alchu, and I'm Mofia Betor Meshore Iraqi. Right. Yeah. That's, that's pretty wonderful because it's something that I relate to coming from an Iraqi Jewish family. It's almost like I was always Iraqi, but I didn't know how to express that into the world. And that's what you do in your poetry. Yom Echad, I got to the festival of the big festival of Buenos Aires, and everyone came and asked me how we are living, and if we have water, and I didn't understand what they were asking me. Then I opened the catalog of the festival, and I saw that it was written, רוני סומק, בגדד, עיראק. הבנתי שמתייחסים אליי כמו על משורר עיראקי. אז ככה ש... So, Ronnie is telling a story that he went to a festival in Buenos Aires? Yes, yeah. And um, they, kept, they came to him and asked him, do you have food, do you have water? And he didn't understand what they were talking about. And then he opened the brochure and he sees that he's been defined as Ronnie Somek, Baghdad, Iraq. So that's why they were asking him um, if he was okay. And I want to say that I'm one of the only people who have also a passport Iraqi. How is that possible? Here. He's showing us he's got, he's one of the few people with an Iraqi yeah. passport. Yeah. That's from when you were two years old and you came to Israel? Yes. My family had a connection. Here's the birth certificate. That's his um, birth certificate. And we are coming with an English connection and I have a passport, Iraqi. Wow. It's, it's rare to see. Here's my father and my mother. And here's the Roni. That was his father and mother, and that's him as a child. So, Judy has an interesting question. Um, does, does it bother you that, that, that you're called an Iraqi poet? What does that say about your Israeliness? That's Judy's question. Ask again. רוני, יש שאלה מג'ודי, does it bother you? זה מפריע שקוראים לך משורר עיראקי? מה זה אומר על הישראלות שלך? אני משורר ישראלי שנולד בעיראק. אני שמח שהעולם הערבי אוהב את השירים שלי. הספר האחרון, ש... יצאו לי ארבעה ספרים בערבית, אחד יצא אפילו בקהיר, ועכשיו יצא ספר שאדוניס כתב את ההקדמה. אבל, אני... זאת אומרת, אני משורר ישראלי, אני לא משורר עיראקי. אני מספר את הסיפור הזה בשביל להראות איך לפעמים דברים יוצאים מהחדר האטום שלך. הטריטוריה שלי, זאת אומרת, אני... כותב בעברית, אני חושב בעברית, אני בוכה בעברית, הכל בעברית. אבל uh, אני לא יכול uh, uh, להתכחש לעובדה שהכתיבה שלי uh, מושפעת גם ממשוררים מזרחיים. Uh, אדוניס אמר לי פעם, לא יעזור לך, תכתוב על מרלין מונדרו, תכתוב על ג'יימס דין, תכתוב על מה שאתה רוצה, אבל הכתיבה שלך היא כתיבה של משורר מזרחי. יש לך ארבסקות בכתיבה שלך. אוקיי, אז let me translate. רוני defines himself as an Israeli poet. He thinks in Hebrew, he writes in Hebrew, everything's in Hebrew. 
Um, he's an Israeli poet that writes, that was born in Baghdad, that writes. Um, Michael, do you want to help me out here? I don't remember everything. Um, he's got four books out in Arabic, and one of them, Adonis. Do you want to explain who Adonis is? Adonis is a Lebanoni Suri. הוא משורר מעולה ומצוין, הוא בן 93, הוא חושב כמו ש... ש... בגיל 17. אני מאוד אוהב את השירים שלו, ובשבילי זה כבוד גדול שהוא כתב את ההקדמה לספר שלי, שרים רנאים תרגמה ויצא לפני חודש באמירויות ובחיפה. Right. So, um, Adonis is a Syrian poet living in Lebanon. And he... No, living in Paris. Uh, li- uh, so Syrian Lebanese living in yeah. Paris. He's 96 old. 92. 92 years old, but he's like 93. 93 year old. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's been in the He's been in the standing for five years for the Nobel Prize, and hopefully he'll get it. Um, did I miss anything else? Yes, uh, Ronnie also said that it, it wouldn't matter if he would be writing about Marilyn Monroe or James Dean or, or anyone else, his writing is arabesque. It's, he, he cannot escape from it. So he's, he's a Middle Eastern, he's, his writing is Mizrahi. His writing is from the Middle East and that's the way it is. And that's, um, that's pretty wonderful because it gives a voice, um, maybe just to end, this gives a voice to a section of um, Israeli society that has been overlooked. Um, last month was um, Israeli Heritage Month, it's a, and there was the Sephardic Refugee Day um, on the 30th of November to commemorate and to mark the exodus of all the Iraqi Jews and all the Jews from Arab lands and Iran. So that, that's very important that we have poets like you, Ronnie, who give voice to the reality. And it wasn't a simple reality as we see, but you're a bridge and it's not about, you also discuss the Ashkenazi story and you give the whole picture of pain and suffering of those years. And that's very appreciated and very real. Um, so I know tonight we didn't do your more rock and roll poems, but um, I appreciate what we have done, and thank you very much for joining us. It was a real privilege and honor. And um, is there anything else you'd like to say that you might not have said? I, I like to say thank you very much <laughs> because I I think that this was a Zoom meeting. We started in the things that Rafi and in the דף יסטה ואחר כך בדברים שאת אמרת ובקריאה, בקריאה המדהימה של קרן ושלך ובשבילי זה כבוד גדול שכל הדבר הזה נעשה ואינשאללה בשמחות. אינשאללה, people are welcome to go off mute and to give your opinion. Yes, everyone can go off mute and just thank you for everyone for coming and thanks again Roni. And Karen and Michael yeah, and Rafi. Yeah. Thank you for making this so special and meaningful. Wonderful. And I know the recording's gonna go far and wide. A lot of people said they couldn't be here tonight, but we've got a special recording. Thank you, Michael, for doing that as well. So תודה רבה. תודה רבה לכולכם. תודה רבה. 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 קוראים לך. כן, היא פה, היא לידי, כן. אוקיי, בסדר. ביי, תודה רבה. ביי ביי. תודה רבה, סליחות, ותודה שוב, באמת שזה היה מרגש ויפה. ונדבר. ממש תודה. ביי ביי, תודה. תודה רבה. 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 תוד
Pleasure. Putting it all together. That was fun. It was really my pleasure. Honor. Such my an pleasure. honor. Yeah. I'll be in touch with you all. Have a good night. Good night.